Hey guys, it's Brian again. Uh, a little while ago, I made a video for you guys about uh, camping off the grid and why it's important to healing from mold illness. And one of the things that you encounter when you camp off the grid is cold weather. And the problem with cold weather is that it freezes things and it mostly freezes your water. Um, it can freeze your fresh water, it can freeze your pipes, it can freeze your wastewater tanks. Um, and this is a problem, not just because of breaking pipes, but also because of dumping your tanks and accessing your fresh water. So I want to go over a few tips that I've learned. And um, one of the main things I'd like to point out is there's actually already some established uh, strategies for dealing with uh, cold weather RVing. One of them is, well, the problem with these established strategies is a lot of them mostly apply to people who are stationary, who, who don't move. Um, one of the things that people do is they can put uh, girders um, around their RV, uh, the bottom of their RV, hay bales or um, insulated foam board to prevent the underbelly of the RV from freezing. And that doesn't work when you're moving around a lot. Um, in mold avoidance, people tend to move around a lot. And, you know, for obvious reasons, you just can't carry all those materials with you and set them up and tear them down when you're moving around a lot. So um, I'll share a few hacks that I've learned. Um, and the main hack, it, well, it's not really a hack, it's the way they're designed. But one of the main tips is if you run the furnace in your RV, it can, um, it, it, the, my furnace and most RVs have a furnace that vents, has one vent that goes into the underbelly of your RV to keep the tanks uh, warm. But one of the problems that I've found with um, using the furnace all the time is you run out of propane really quickly when you're in cold weather. So that's certainly something you can do. And if you have enough propane, that's great. But I just wanted to give you guys some options for being a little bit more flexible than that. Um, and even with running the propane, the valves uh, on your gray tank and your black tank still tend to freeze. And um, again, stationary cold weather RV people can put heat tape on those valves and there's other little tricks to keep them from freezing. But, um, you know, I haven't been able to do that because we're moving around. Now, one of the, the caveats I would like to point out is the tips that I'm about to mention to you um, don't work really well in super freezing cold areas that stay frozen all the time. And, you know, if you're going to be in those areas and you're going to be moving around, um, you're really going to need a, a cold weather RV that, you know, is designed for being in the cold all the time. And even then you're going to have some problems. Uh, so, so the first tip is make sure you buy an RV with minimal wood in the walls, because no matter what you do to manage moisture, um, condensation forms in cold when you're breathing and humidifying the inside of the RV with your breath and it's cold outside. It's just the way that physics works. It's like when you take a, a Coke can out of the fridge and it gets that uh, that sweat on the can because there's a temper temperature differential. We haven't had a whole lot of problems with condensation. Um, we do have an RV that um, has not a lot of wood in the construction, but that is something to be aware of in cold weather camping. Um, the second thing that I would like to point out is check the weather and find out when the warmer days are going to be because some of what you're going to be doing is going to be on the warmer days. So what, what I tend to do is when the weather's going to warm up, those are the days when I tend to think about refilling my freshwater tank and also dumping my tanks. And I found that if I put a couple of space heaters around the valves, uh, the the, um, uh, the gray water and the black water tank valves outside for a couple of hours, I can thaw them out enough to dump my tanks. Usually about every seven or eight days I need to do this. Yes, this does mean that you need access to power. If you don't have access to power, you could still run your furnace, but you're going to have a hard time thawing out those valves. Um, the, you know, most of the, the, the tips that I'm going to give you actually do require that you have access to power. Um, at some points in time, if you have no power and you're off the grid and you're camping in the cold and you have a family or you have a bunch of people using the tanks, you're going to have a rough time. Um, you can always keep that furnace running and keep uh, the tanks as warm as you can. 
but you're going to go through propane quickly. Um, you're going to go through a, a regular canister of propane every day or two, probably. So you just need to use a lot of propane, which is fine. That's fine too. I mean, part of this whole thing is figuring out your situation and deciding what is going to work for you personally, um, given your resources and how close you are to the store to get more propane. And and if you have access to power. Um, when it's really cold, I like to stay at campgrounds that have um, power hookups because then I can use my space heaters. One of the nice things about space heaters is when you just plug them in and turn them on, you don't run out of fuel. You don't really have to worry about it. Another nice thing about space heaters is they provide more uh, warmth than the furnace does. And this is kind of weird, but if I keep my RV at 55 degrees with the space heaters on, we can stay warm. With the furnace on, it needs to be like 65 or 70. I don't really know why. It's kind of a different heat with those space heaters. I think one of the reasons is that uh, with the space heaters, um, you can kind of cuddle up to them and get right near them and they keep you a little bit warmer than the furnace does. As soon as that furnace kicks off when it's reached its target temperature, it just feels really cold. And so this might seem a little bit non-scientific, but it's a very practical tip that I've actually found to be pretty legitimate. Um, okay, so let's get down to some of the nuts and bolts. A lot of RVs have, I'm gonna move the camera around here to show you guys some stuff, but a lot of RVs have this compartment I got my headlamp on so I can show you where all of the plumbing is kept. It's usually kept in one compartment. This is under the bunk bed, my daughter's bunk bed right here. And you can see this is where the um, all the plumbing comes in. The fresh water tank, um, the city water connection, the hot water heater, the water pump is in there. Um, water pumps are very sensitive to cold, so be careful with your water pump. What I do in here is I run a uh, 250 watt space heater in here all the time. It's a it's a baby little space heater. You can kind of see it in there. It doesn't take up a lot of energy. I plug it in right here. And what that does is it allows that compartment to stay nice and warm. And, and you know, um, you may not realize, but um, that compartment can get frozen even when the RV is um, warm inside because the, the walls are so thinly insulated in an RV that it stuff can freeze in there. I've had that happen. So that keeps everything nice and toasty in there. I've also taken off this uh, compartment here underneath my bathtub so that the pipes down there can stay warm. And you might think it's funny that something inside the RV can freeze, but it definitely can. So anywhere there's plumbing, um, I tend to leave my, my cabinet doors open at night so that the plumbing underneath the sink doesn't get exposed to the cold because it's right up against the wall. I do the same thing in my um, kitchen. I leave the kitchen cabinet um, open and thankfully RVs don't have a lot of plumbing. Um, they have, you know, just a shower and two sinks usually and a toilet. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how to manage. I'm just going to plug my phone in here because it's about to die. But Let's talk a little bit about how to manage your water. So I actually have noticed, and a friend of mine who lives in Canada has told me this, that if you leave your your pipes unpressurized at night, they tend not to freeze. One of the reasons that pipes freeze is because they're under pressure. You think about residential houses, there's always water pressure. So if you turn off your water pump at night, or if you unhook your hose, which definitely unhook your hose at night, that's another thing that uh, full-time RV people tend to have heat tape or foam insulation around your hose, but in cold weather, I very much recommend you just unhook your hose from the outside of your RV at night. Um, but if you keep your water pump off and then you make sure that your sink is, you run it for a minute till the water pressure drops so that there's no more water coming out, then whatever water is in your pipe system is not full. So when it freezes and expands a little bit, it's not gonna break your pipes. And I found this also to be true with the fresh water tank, that if I don't fill it all the way to the top, even when it freezes, it doesn't break. Um, so the fresh water tank and the black water tank and the gray water tank, you can just expect those to freeze sometimes. And I have not had any pipes break and I've gotten down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you're getting down a lot colder than that, then you know things may change. So what I do is, I always keep extra water in the RV in case my pipes, in case the fresh water tank freezes and I don't want to use the water pump. So, you know, just go to Walmart and get some crystal geysers 
uh, gal one gallon ones and you can drink them you can cook with them you can use them to wash dishes if you need to just always keep extra water in the rv at all times even, this is even smart even when it's not freezing because you just never know um you know it's just it's just a good survival technique and also good for when things freeze up so i always keep extra water um so that about covers the, the fresh water. And by the way, we don't really drink the water in our fresh water tank anyway because it just gets stagnant down there. Um, we shower in it, we wash dishes in it. We don't really drink it. So it's good to have water to drink anyway. Um, as far as the black and the gray water tanks go, I haven't really had any issues with those, but I do make sure that if a really cold weather stretch is coming up that I will um, dump those so that they're empty and ready to go so that then I can go off the grid. And as you're using the restroom and washing dishes, the water is going to sort of flow down into the tanks and then freeze. And it's I haven't really had any issues with that. I still use the toilet and I use the sinks and the shower normally. Um, and then if they freeze, they freeze and I thaw them out later. So you got to kind of ebb and flow with the weather. Um, and if the weather is getting bad, that's a good time to fill up your freshwater tank, maybe only halfway so that it doesn't get full and have that pressure issue and dump your tanks after you've run a space heater on the valves for a little while. And then you can make it, you know, another seven or eight days um, in the cold without having to dump. Um, and this sort of allows you to be a little more versatile than the permanent type setups where people use insulation to insulate their underbellies and I actually have not had any issues and so some of you guys may be laughing at me thinking that this sounds so um, thrown together and and you know all of the cold weather RV groups are gonna have different and more thorough solutions but the, but you guys have to remember my goal my goal isn't to live in Alaska for six months out of the year and you know where it's freezing all the time if you're gonna do that in an RV you can pretty much just delete this video and do something different my purpose is doing mold avoidance where um, I don't want to be restricted and not be able to go to some nicer pristine areas because of the weather. I'm not going to be there forever, not going to be there for months and months. I'm not going to Montana in February. I'm talking about places where, you know, it, it gets above 32 degrees um, and maybe even into the low 40s um, every few days so that you have access to, you know, running water and things like that. I'm not talking about extreme um, RV, you know, cold weather. Uh, and, you know, this was an important psychological bridge for me to get past because for a while I was just afraid to go anywhere that was below freezing um, because I didn't, you know, know how to handle it. And so having the skills to deal with a few weeks of freezing temperature really gives you versatility to uh, go where you want to go. And that's kind of the whole name of the game in mold avoidance really is to stay flexible. You know, the times where we have gotten too committed to a location have really been the times where we've run into trouble, not just with weather, but with toxins and other stuff. Um, and eventually, you know, we do want to commit to a location and buy land and not move around a lot. But when you're learning mold avoidance and you're in the beginning stages of detox, you don't know enough and your body's not stable enough yet to really commit to a location. So the name of the game is flexibility. And um, I also just made a video that I hope you'll watch about camping off the grid. And that's been a huge, huge benefit to learning how to run the RV um, in relative comfort without hookups, and especially without sewer hookups. And that's something that if you can do that, you can you can have access to a lot more healing than if you you know, try to stay. I, I was staying at places that only had RV hookups for a long time. And a friend of mine was like, you're in an RV, you can go anywhere. Why aren't you staying in more pristine locations? And I thought about it and he was right. And the more I have done that, um, the better off I've been. I've also, you know, tried to take advantage of the resources that I can get at different campgrounds. Some campgrounds maybe do not have power, but they have great water. So I'll fill up my freshwater tank there and we'll do laundry and we'll shower because the water's great. Other campgrounds maybe have horrible water, but they have really good power, reliable power. So I'll make sure to show up to those campgrounds with my water tank already full and um, I'll take more advantage of the power. So you gotta kind of got to be a little bit flexible and, and realize what resources you have access to. And for those of you who are not familiar with mold avoidance, a lot of this might sound a little bit silly, like, why don't we just stay at RV parks that have full hookups in good 
weather and then we don't have to deal with any of this stuff. Well, that's the way that I used to think. And I don't blame you if you think that way, because sometimes it takes learning the hard way. But the ben the healing benefits of being able to go into some more remote areas without as many hookups are profound. And in order to experience those healing benefits, you really have to develop some um, intestinal fortitude, if you will, some uh, willingness to um, live a little more primitively and a little differently than uh, some other people do. But I'll tell you that um, I am extremely comfortable in, in this RV right now. You know, it's getting down to six degrees here tonight. We got six inches of snow last night and um, I'm all bundled up now because I was just outside. But, you know, I, I, I do not get cold at night. I have two space heaters running. Um, one of them is, uh, they're actually both this little, I don't know if you can see there. Let me turn the light on. But they're both this little Walmart model and I run them both at the same time. They have two settings, a low and a high. And the high setting is 1500 watts. The low setting is 750 watts. And I don't run them both on high, but I run them. Um, sorry for all the camera movements here. I hope you're, you're not getting motion sickness, but um, I run them, one of them on high and one of them on low. And that uh, produces the, enough amperage, or I should say consumes enough amperage that it doesn't blow my 30 amp. Uh, circuit in my trailer and it keeps it you know as warm as I need it to be I also sometimes use the furnace a little bit as a hybrid uh, to keep the tanks from freezing but I mostly use the space heaters I just like space heaters better than the furnace I like the feeling of the heat I like that I don't burn burn through fuel it's a real pain in the butt to run out of propane I'll give you another tip while we're talking about propane um, my RV and most RVs have room for two propane bottles in the front of the RV, but I keep an extra one or two around um, so that if we run out in the middle of the night and I've already switched to my backup bottle, that I have an extra one. Um, another tip is your RV generally will have a switch in between the propane bottles where you can choose left or right or both. I don't recommend having the both setting on because then you're drawing from both of the tanks at the same time and you won't know when you're empty because you won't know where that halfway point is. I very much prefer to use the left or the right tank first, and then when that one's empty, it cues me in to have to go switch it by hand. It's a little bit more work, but I have to go switch the regulator by hand, And but then it, it mentally triggers me to say, oh, I'm halfway out of propane. Okay, we better start thinking about going to get propane. Um, so, you know, it's just a little trick I've learned. Um, again, permanent stationary RV people will laugh and they'll say, well, why don't you just get bigger propane tanks? You know, you see some of these RVs that have huge propane tanks that, you know, have to be brought in by a special truck and refilled by a special truck. Again, that's not my goal. My goal is not to sit in the same location all winter with um, girding and skirting around my RV and a big propane tank. And, you know, my goal is to be able to move around and stay flexible. So you kind of have to stay a little bit, you know, adaptable and, and figure out a, a few tricks to survive the winter. Um, it really helps to sit down and think about your RV a little bit. You know, what system does my RV have? One of the nice things about our, an RV that I really like is when I used to own a house, we don't own a house anymore. We only have a truck and a trailer, which makes traveling a lot more affordable because we have no bills except for our traveling bills. But when I used to own a house, you know, the systems are more complicated. Um, I had to hire a plumber, I had to hire a furnace guy, I had to hire, you know, whoever, but the RV, it's so small and everything's so accessible that I've been able to really figure out a lot of it myself and become a lot more um, uh, independent in that regard. And so I just suggest that you learn your RV. Where are the pipes? Where's the power hookups? How do the tanks work? What are tanks? Um, what is a water pump? When are you drawing water off of your freshwater tank? And when are you drawing water out of the uh, hose at the RV park? And feel free to ask me questions or ask, you know, other experienced RVers questions. But y if you really see, I mean, you know, I hate to discourage new people because not everyone is going to want to have the mechanical knowledge to do this. But if you if you can learn to think about your RV and how it works, you know, I see so many people running into disasters in their 
um, RVs a lot of the time, and so many of them are preventable. You know, people people um, put their slide out. My RV has a slide. Most of them do, and it gets caught on something, and it strains the engine and breaks the slide, and then you're screwed. I mean, when your slide is broken, um, you can't move. You're you you're out. You're going to be in a hotel that night, probably a moldy hotel, spending 250 bucks a night. So. Um, check around your slide to make sure that there's no open cabinets or things that are going to hang up your slide. Um, a, a lot of RV stuff can be prevented. You know, these are pretty flimsy, uh, delicate trailers. They're made to be very lightweight, so they're not built very solid. You have to really think things through when you're moving them, when you're towing them, when you're setting them up. Um, you, you have to sort of be a little bit mechanical or at least, um, you know, be a problem solver and think it through a little bit you know it, anybody can really do it you don't have to be mechanical you just have to think about what you're doing you know what what am i operating what switch am i um switching what what does this switch do why would i use this switch instead of that switch and uh, ask questions ask questions on the mold avoiders group you know um there, there's a winter rv camping facebook group and there's a full-time families rv group there's a lot of places you can ask questions uh but I really prefer to ask my questions on the mold avoiders group because we have different goals than normal full-time RV people. And so our solutions are going to be a little bit different, but, um, anyway, I don't want this video to go too long. Um, but you know, I, I really, I've really been successful so far this winter, it, you know, as long as it's not too cold, I'm not talking about Montana here or Alaska. I'm talking about places that get down to, you know, normally a low at night of maybe 20 degrees or 25. And then some nights you survive the zero or five or 10, but then it shoots back up to 35 or 40 the next day. If you're not getting above freezing at all, you're gonna need some more permanent implementation of heat tape and skirting and some other things, which that's fine if you're stationary, but if you're moving around a lot, it's not gonna work. So, you know, just stay flexible, read, learn, ask questions. Um, and I hope this has been a good introduction to you and I hope it's helped. Thanks.